2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2. To Timothy, a beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that is in you also. You know, it's an interesting situation that we find throughout the body of Christ that many of us uh, were uh, given our first exposure to the Christian faith through the faith of a mother or a grandmother. And I was thinking about this and why would that be? And what I'm saying is that, well, it's a mother who is the first teacher from, from the very beginning of life. The, it, it's the mother that teaches the child how to how to function in this world. And then the grandmother is, is the, the number one go-to babysitter, I would say. And, and so what the mother doesn't do, then the grandmother uh, is, steps in there and does that. So from, from the very first uh, moments of life, a mother and a grandmother are, are there to, to guide and to protect a, a growing child. And, of course, later, then there are, uh, you know, the fathers and the siblings and, you know, and uh, the community. You know, when they say it takes a village, well, that doesn't mean the village is supposed to take the place of a mother or a father. But the, the, the village does teach the kid things. The, the, the neighborhood uh, ones that they play with, uh, they'll learn things from that. But the first teachers in a child's life or are their mother and their grandmother. And so I believe that this is uh, not just the case for Timothy. I think most of us could say that it was because of the faith of, of a mother or a grandmother. And that's not to, to uh, decry the, the, the faith of a father or a grandfather either. But I think we can all say that we had a praying mother or grandmother or maybe great grandmother um, that was influential in our lives. But I want to look beyond just the, the individual uh, situation here, and I want us to see how this applies to the body of Christ. Because I believe that there's many things in the Bible which are, as they say, types and shadows, they're parables, they're, they're metaphors, they, they symbolize something. And, and I believe that that uh, a mother or a grandmother and their faith symbolize what the church is supposed to be for a Christian. For someone when they get born again, uh, it, it's not God's intention that they just be kind of an automaton out there uh, flailing around in the world, that, that he intends for Christians to be a part of the body of Christ. And the body of Christ throughout the New Testament is referred to in the feminine gender. And, and so we're going to talk about that today. Go to Proverbs chapter 31. Now, I'm not going to be talking about the part in there about the, the godly wife who can find. I mean, I believe that definitely has something to do with this. But we're going to look at the first nine verses. And if you will, I'm going to read this out of the King James Version. Proverbs 31, verse 1. 
The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. Now this is interesting. The word Lemuel in Hebrew means unto God. You will see many times in the scriptures where, and the, the, the one the notable one is I think Hannah, who, uh, that God, uh, that she was childless, kind of like Sarah, you know, was childless. And Elizabeth, uh, John the Baptist's mother, was childless. Well, Hannah was childless, and so she uh, prayed to God and said, God, if you will give me a child, I will dedicate him to you. So that's actually what this word uh, Lemuel means. It means dedicated unto God. Now, the reason I'm applying this to the body of Christ is because it says that if you are a born-again Christian, uh, you are unto God. Let me give you that. Keep the place here in Proverbs 31 and go to Revelation chapter 1. And what it is that we are unto God is, is amazing. Proverbs, excuse me, Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. Well, it says that God has made us kings and priests unto God. That's us he's talking about. We have... When we were born again, we were born unto God as kings and priests in order to, to, um, to exercise the authority of Jesus Christ and to stand in the gap for others. He has made us kings and priests unto God the Father and to him be glory and dominion forever. So back here in Proverbs 31, keep the place in Revelation too, we'll be back there. But in Proverbs 31, it's not just to this guy, Lemuel, that this applies. Because he was unto God, and we are unto God. And says this is what his mother taught him. Well, there are three things, I believe, that every mother, once a child gets old enough to, to make their own choices in life, there's, there's certain things that, that a mother wants to be sure that they instill in a child. And this is something which God has tasked the church to instill in every believer. I'll, I'll write these three things up here. First of all, there's purity. Now, that has a lot of uh, implications, uh, you know, we talk about, you know, just hygiene, cleanliness, uh, you know, wash your hands, wipe your feet when you come in the door. But then you get older and, you know, there's, there's dirty jokes and there's uh, sexual sins and other things that, that uh, a mother would want to teach their child to, to be pure from. There's purity. There's sobriety. You know, there's a lot of things that a person can be drunk with besides just wine. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of uh, illicit drugs, uh, and there's all kinds of things that the world uh, can intoxicate a person with. Uh, even just entertainment, television, movies, games. And in this world, there's so much of that that it's almost like the whole society has gotten drunk, so to speak. And then, the, the third thing that I'm, we're going to talk about this morning is justice. You know, we look around in our world today, and we see things, and, and they're not just. You know, there's a, a, a hairdresser in Dallas that's just trying to feed her family, and she's a single mother, and and because she's run afoul of a, of a judge, they throw her in jail. And, and people say, well, that's, that's not just. 
Well, justice, teaching someone justice starts when you're little bitty, when you're playing with, with your neighbor and you're playing with toys and, and you want to hoard all the toys to yourself and the mother has to come say, no, that's not fair. You've got to play fair. You know, and, and this, this goes from there to, to 100. Well, that's what the scriptures are saying here. Uh, verse 2 says, What, my son? What, the son of my womb? And what, the son of my vows? Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy heart. You know, that goes along with, uh, the, in the New Testament, when they're talking about wine, um, you know, they, they talk about it as its medicinal use. And so that's kind of what he's talking about here in verse 6. Verse 7, let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. Well, we could almost put, um, you know, Prozac and, and certain uh, psychotropic medications in, in with that. Um, verse 8. Open thy mouth for the dumb in the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Well, that describes the human race pretty well. Um, open thy mouth, judge righteously, plead the cause of the poor and needy. Well, let's go back and look at some of this. You know, over there in verse 3, he talks about women. Now, I don't think that this is uh, Lemuel's mother telling Lemuel he's supposed to be celibate. Uh, he's talking about a certain kind of women. In fact, in the Amplified, it says, um, don't uh, give your strength to loose women. Well, the, the scripture is pretty uh, explicit on that. Go to Revelation chapter 17. The, again, this is, this is a type and shadow. It's a, it's a metaphor. It's a parable uh, to describe something that, that goes way beyond just uh, a lady of the night. Uh, Revelation 17 verse 1. It says, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot. Okay, there's, that's what we're talking about, right? But uh, let's see what this is. The great harlot who sits on many waters. And over there in, in uh, one of the next verses on the next page, it says that the waters are... Um, our tribes and languages and nations and, and so forth. So this is, this is a metaphor for something that's, that's uh, loose and loose in the world with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. Well, they weren't trained by Lemuel's mother then, were they? Right? And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. See, this is the warning that there are things in this world that will pervert a person. And that a mother's job to raise a child right, to teach them right and wrong, is to be wary, to be aware of these things and to avoid them. And you see, it should be the job of the church to warn the body of Christ about this and about these things that are, that are going on in our world that, that are, are destroying the purity and the sobriety of the church. And I don't think the church is doing a very good job. I don't know that I'm doing a very good job of it. And, and then justice. Well, we'll get to that in a minute. Let me keep reading here. Verse 3. 
Revelation 17, verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. This is a picture of the world system that is coming into being now, right before our very eyes. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. See, that's what royalty is arrayed in. That's the, the clothing of, of kings and queens. And was adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead was a name written, Mystery. Now that right there tells you that this is something that is hidden from the population at large. That this is, this is something that most people are not really seeing because it's not out in the open. Right now, if, if you listen to the TV at all, and I recommend that you don't, but if, if unfortunately you do, and many of us, you know, we at least want to see what the weather's supposed to be tomorrow, even though they get that wrong more than they get it right. But uh, if you have the TV on, sooner or later, you're going to hear some talking head um, put down and, and criticize uh, conspiracy theorists. Well, a mystery is a conspiracy, folks. You know, and that's not to say that every conspiracy theory is correct or that they're all this one, but this one is what the pundits of our world would call a conspiracy theory. If you read this to one of the talking heads, oh, well, that's a Christian conspiracy theory. No, it's in the Bible. Mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Just this, the very thing that King Lemuel's mother was warning him about. The mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw this woman, and she was drunk with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. You see, where this world system is going uh, is not going to be favorable to Jesus. You will be, if you stand up for Jesus, it says you will be hated by all men for my name's sake. Je uh, Steve talked about that in his ministry Friday night. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Well, go back to Revelation chapter 14. What God is looking for, the, the full implication of what King Lemuel's mother was warning him about uh, loose women, we are instructed here in Revelation chapter 14 verse 4. It says, these are, they, are the ones who were not defiled with women. Now, let me point out something else here. You know, in Revelation 17, it speak, spoke of one woman, the great harlot. But it says she's the mother of harlots. So that means that this uh, spirit, if you will, has given birth to a lot of other things in the world, a lot of other uh, realms, a lot of other systems that are anti-Christ in their nature. You know, political systems, educational systems, entertainment systems, uh, etc. Well, those are women. It says, that, and, and the, the 144,000 that it's speaking of here, who follow the Lamb wherever He goes, they are not defiled with women. For they are virgins. They are pure as virgins, it says in the Amplified. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. So if, if we have made a commitment, we're going to follow Jesus wherever He goes, sooner or later, we are going to run crossways with this world and its systems. You might as well just write that down. These were redeemed from among men being the first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Okay. Still keep the place in Revelation, but let's go back to Proverbs 31 again. 
in verse 4, it says, Well, it's not for kings to drink wine or princes strong drink. Well, the Scripture warns about this. In fact, a lot of times, the Scripture puts that wine together with the sexual immorality. Now, again, we can look at that in just a natural sense, and you can say, well, you know, uh, honky-tonk women, okay, there you'd have wine and, and loose women all in the same package. But let's move beyond that. Let's see, what does this symbolize? Well, go to um, Hosea. Hosea, can you see, by the dawn's early light. Hosea, chapter... 4 verse 11 This is some pretty strong admonition here It says harlotry wine in verse 11 harlotry wine and new wine enslave the heart. You know, people are in bondages. There's all kinds of, um, there's all kinds of things to which people are addicted to. I was thinking about this this morning. And, and this is not a political statement. It may, may, on the surface, it may sound like it, but it isn't. You know, when we, when we were in the first grade, and we learned the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. There were three things in there that the flag and the Republic of the United States of America was supposed to, was supposed to stand for. One was that we were under God. Well, they've been working at taking that one away for 50 years, 60 years. Okay? Indivisible. Well, look around you now. What do you see? Nothing but divisions. And not just Republican versus Democrat. You've got federal versus state and state versus local. And, and you've got those who, who, who uh, want to go along with, the, with wearing the mask and following the stay-at-home orders and those that don't. And, and uh, on and on it goes. There's division everywhere you look. Under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Well, everybody is given an illusion that we're free, but your freedoms have, have been eroding for a long time because even people in the government have, have been saying for years, well, the Constitution is just a piece of paper. Well, first of all, our freedom comes from God. You know, we were endowed by our Creator with inalienable rights. That's not something that any government is going to give you. And if you're looking to the government to safeguard those things for you, think again. We get our freedom from God. But it says that harlotry and wine and new wine are what enslave the heart. You know, it's because the, the, the body politic has gotten so intoxicated with all of the things of modern life that governments can start becoming more uh, totalitarian and people don't even notice it. As long as they get their Wi-Fi and their beer, then they're fine. My people ask counsel from their wooden idols or their metal and plastic idols and, and their staff informs them, the staff on the, on the media uh, networks and so forth. For the spirit of harlotry has caused them to stray, and they have played the harlot against their God. Go to Habakkuk chapter 2. Here, there's another uh, element that's brought into the mix that, that has everything to do with harlotry and wine, and that is money. 
You know, if you don't have any money, then, then you, can't, uh, you can't enlist the services of a prostitute and you can't buy wine. In fact, I think it's interesting that they determined that uh, liquor stores were an essential service but when, when every other kind of business, hair salons and, and, and uh, you know, uh, guitar center <laughs> was shut down, right? Okay, uh, Habakkuk chapter 2 in verse uh, 5, and I'll read this in the Amplified. It says, moreover, wine and wealth are treacherous. And the proud man is restless and cannot stay at home. His appetite is large like that of Sheol, and his greed is like death and cannot be satisfied. He gathers to himself all nations and collects all people as if he owned them. See, this is what happens when individuals nations when the whole population of the world uh, rejects purity and rejects sobriety uh, then then they become controllable by money okay back in uh, Proverbs chapter 31 the reason why in verse 5 that Lemuel's mother told him to stay away from booze. What, and he's a king, right? The reason why he should is because if he's intoxicated, he would pervert the justice that's due to the afflicted. And then in verse 8, it says, So open your mouth for the dumb. Well, that has two meanings in, in modern English. You know, dumb can mean you're unable to speak for yourself. But it also means, you know, you're, you're, you're not fully awake. You know, you're kind of, duh. Well, that would be dumb. Well, that's where the, the whole population of planet Earth, they're trying to get everybody there. Okay, and so justice would require waking people up. Open your mouth for the dumb and in the cause of such that are appointed to destruction. Well, we know the devil has appointed humanity for destruction. Jesus said that himself. He come, the devil comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Open your mouth. Judge righteously. Plead the cause of the poor and needy. Well, let's talk about justice just a little. The word justice in Hebrew in the English Bible translations is sometimes translated judgment. But we need to understand something there. Judgment doesn't necessarily mean punishment. I mean, it can if you're on the wrong side of things, but basically judgment means justice. It's a, it's a reconciliation. You know, it's bringing everything into balance, into harmony. Go to Job chapter 32. In the book of Job, he came under judgment. And without going into all the reasons of that, eventually he was delivered. Okay, so it had a happy ending. And he actually ended up with a double portion. So, you know, uh, we, we shouldn't say, oh, poor old Job, that was so terrible what happened. Well, in this, it is a, a metaphor, it is a parable, really, of what the devil tries to do to every one of us, okay? But I want you to see that not everything that Job's friends told him was correct. But then there was this one guy named Elihu who showed up at the end of the book, and apparently what he said was correct because God didn't uh, challenge anything that Elihu had to say. Let's see some of the things he said to uh, to Job. Uh, chapter 32, verse 6. So Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Barzite, the Buzzite, answered and said, Well, I'm young in years, and you are very old. Therefore, I was afraid and dared not declare my opinion to you. 
Well, you know, that's a, that's a good uh, policy to have, not to speak out of turn. I said age should speak and the multitude of years should teach wisdom. But, you know, there was, there was something going on here that, that goes on. Just because somebody is uh, in that position of authority or just because somebody is in a position where they have the, the resume, they have the experience, they, you know, they, they have uh, the degrees or whatever, that doesn't mean they have wisdom. And that certainly doesn't mean that they're right. You know, the ones that, uh, that were, saw to it that Anne Frank and, and the Jews were, were put to death in Nazi Germany, they were obeying their authorities. And the ones who hid Anne Frank and the Jews, like Corrie ten Boom, they were defying the authorities. So just because somebody is a high muckety muck doesn't mean they're right, and it doesn't mean they're wise. Just, just keep that in mind because you hear a lot of pundits out there who, who claim to be something because here's what Elihu said in verse 8. He said, but there is a spirit in man and the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. In fact, you know, in, in Romans chapter 1, it says that God has given everybody that. It's called a conscience. When a wrongdoer does wrong, they know it's wrong. Now, whether or not they choose to do it, maybe, maybe their mother didn't raise them right. I don't know, you know, but they still know it's wrong, but they're going to do it anyway. But he says, there is a spirit in man, and the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. Great men are not always wise, nor do the aged always understand justice. Let me give you some examples of this in the Bible. This is not just Elihu's opinion. Go, I keep the place here in Job. Go to Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah was kind of like Job. When he began uh, his prophetic ministry, he was young. And, and he was well aware that he didn't have all of the, uh, you know, the titles and all of the credentials that, that he would have expected someone uh, in that position that God was calling him to, to have. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 4 says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, and I ordained you a prophet to the nations. And then I said, well, Lord, I cannot speak, for I'm only a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say, I'm a youth. You know, that's a, that, he wasn't being rebuked by God. God was actually encouraging him. It, it was really good that he didn't presume to know something that he didn't know. God was saying here, he was saying, hey, don't worry about that. He said, you shall go to whom I shall send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. See, so it's, it took the, the burden off of his back. It, it, it wasn't, he didn't have to, to learn through experience or through the college of hard knocks or whatever, all of the, the things that he was going to say. And... You know, that we should take comfort in that because uh, this business of, of you know, the, the ones with the titles being the authority, that can even happen within the body of Christ. You know, you, you turn your, your TV on and brother so-and-so says something or other. Well, that doesn't make it right just because he's brother so-and-so and he's been saying it for 60 years and he's got a degree from this or that or he's got a, a billion-dollar uh, enterprise and a private jet. You know, and the fact that you think you're nothing, that's really a good thing if you will go to God and let him download you with the truth instead of looking to somebody else, uh, even me, to tell you what, you know, the truth is. Do not say I'm a youth, for you shall go to all whom I send you, 
and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. And then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and pull down. You know, that's not the prosperity message necessarily, is it? Okay, to destroy and throw down and then to build and plant. You know, what, one thing you learn if you do gardening at all is you've got to prepare the soil first. And if you don't, then you're going to end up with a lot of other stuff growing in there that you don't want. That's not the seed you planted. And this is the case in the church today. There's a lot of things that are growing in the church. I mean, I could go on and on about that. And it, it begins to affect us in ways that we don't realize. Well, back in Job uh, chapter 32... In verse 9, he says this thing about the great men are not always wise and nor do the aged always understand justice. Well, go to Isaiah chapter 26. God has a way of bringing understanding of justice. And it would be, it would be better if people were just teachable. But if they're not, all is not lost. Because God, God can get the message to you. He got the message to Nebuchadnezzar, and he certainly wasn't teachable. Uh, and, and he ended up uh, out of his mind for seven years. And when, it, when he finally... His wits came back to him. He realized that, that God is God and he's not, and he, Nebuchadnezzar, is not in charge of the world even though he had been the ruler of the most powerful empire on the planet at the time. Um, Isaiah chapter 26, verse 7. I'll read this in the Amplified. It says, The way of the righteous is level and straight. You, O Lord, are upright. Direct aright and make level the path of the just and the righteous. See, the way of justice is level. It's a level playing field. In this world, there are no level playing fields. But God's way of justice and righteousness is a level playing field. It says, yes, in the path of your judgments, O Lord, we wait expectantly for you. That's not the message most Christians want to hear. They, they want to have that judgment postponed as long as possible so they can continue enjoying their life the way they have become used to it. But he's saying, no, we should want God's judgment. Our heartfelt desire is for your name and for the remembrance of you. My soul yearns for you, O Lord, in the night. And yes, it's night. It's dark. Yes, my spirit within me seeks you earnestly. For only when your judgments are in the earth will the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness. And then in Isaiah chapter 28, Verse 16. This tells us that part of our assignment, just like part of uh, Jeremiah's assignment, you know, to, to, to tear down the stuff that shouldn't be there and then to build and plant the stuff that God did want, it's part of the assignment of the body of Christ for us to be people of justice for us not to not to be um, one-sided in, in 
in any particular issue or any particular opinion uh, and, and and to be fair to be fair-minded to 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 be honest um, to to not uh, to not pick sides in a quarrel to to not judge one another uh, based upon our preconceived ideas of the way things are supposed to be but to realize that that God loves everybody equally you know he loves that that sinner out there in the honky-tonk running around with loose women just as much as he loves you if you grew up in a nice home and you went to all of the right schools and, and dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's um, you know we, we must be fair just people and to the extent that the church isn't and it really that's the history of the church you know you've had had one group of Christians burning another group of Christians at the stake because their theology is wrong or, or you know you look in the book of James and it says well you know if someone comes into your your place and they're dressed real nice and somebody else comes in in shaggy clothes and they don't smell real good then you make them stand over there and he says these things ought not so to be well there is something in the realm of justice that I believe God wants to instill in us and we don't have it yet you know this is not a matter of your salvation I'm not saying that if you don't get this you're going to hell that's not what I'm saying at all what I'm saying is this is what spiritual maturity is supposed to produce Isaiah chapter 26 verse 16 says behold I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation now we understand that stone is Jesus right he is the picture. He is the epitome of one who lived justly. I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, and whoever believes in him will not act hastily. And I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plumb line. And hail will sweep away the refuge of lies. Well, that's kind of like that. Only when the judgments of the Lord are in the earth will the inhabitants of the earth learn righteousness. Well, when the judgments sweep away the refuge of lies, then people are going to realize that those were lies. Hail will sweep away the refuge of lies. And the waters will overflow the hiding place. And your covenant with death will be annulled and your agreement with Sheol will not stand and when the overflowing scourge passes through then you will be trampled down by it don't make a covenant with death don't decide well okay as long as I just get this this and this then to heck with the rest of you uh, and don't decide well okay God just just take me home now kill me now so I don't have to go through any of these things that are coming on the earth no God put us here for a reason we have a job to do and what I'm saying here is part of the job we have to do is to exemplify justice to a world that thinks there is no justice okay go you can let proverbs go go to um galatians chapter 4. galatians 4 verse 22. For it is written, Abraham had two sons, one by a bondwoman and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he that was of the free woman was through God's promise, which things are symbolic, for there are two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar, 
is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. Let's talk about that. Keep the place here in Galatians and go to Matthew chapter 23. See, you thought he was going to talk about the heathen there when he mentioned Hagar, but no, he's talking about uh, the Hebrew people. He's talking about the Jews because he's talking about an old covenant that has been uh, superseded by a new covenant. So he's really talking about two covenants. He's talking about the, the old covenant uh, and the new covenant. But, but he mentions Jerusalem as being a representative of the old covenant. And here's why that this is so. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 23, verse 7. Uh, Jesus is lamenting over Jerusalem. And he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks. You see, Jesus is even describing this motherly attitude of wanting to train them in the, the correct way. As a, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you will see me no more until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, you know, that has a happy ending too because uh, uh, Jesus is going to come back and uh, Israel is going to recognize him as their Messiah eventually. And they are going to say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Back to Galatians chapter 4. You know, verse 25 said, uh, this is uh, Jerusalem which now is and is in bondage with her children. Verse 26. But the Jerusalem which is free is above and is the mother of us all. What's well, an interesting uh, picture there, isn't it? That we are born again from above. This is what Jesus said to Nicodemus. He said, you must be born again. But see, that word again has more than one meaning. It doesn't just mean for a second time. And that was the part that kind of got Nicodemus confused. But it means more than just for a, a second time. It means in a second way. You know, and Jesus went on to explain that. That which is born of flesh is flesh. But that which is born of spirit is spirit. So here when he's talking about us being born from above, that we are the Jerusalem that is from above, we're talking about a whole new way of life. We're talking about a whole different set of rules, a, a whole different uh, way of living. Go back to Revelation chapter 12. Here's the, here's the metaphor of the Jerusalem that's above, of our celestial mother, if you will, because that's the church. That's how Jesus uh, embodies. That's how he inhabits the church. You know, it says he inhabits the praise of his people. Jesus said, wherever two or more of you are gathered in my name, I'm there. Well, that means that this is something that is above. It's invisible, but it's real. Revelation 12. Now, a great sign appeared in heaven. See, yeah, that's above. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. And being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. Now isn't this interesting? 
That's the same description about the harlot sitting on the beast, right? Well, this represents what is coming against the church. It's what's coming against you and me right now. Seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. And his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she bore a male child, a man child, who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. See, so this business of being born from above uh, is uh, essential if we're going to be delivered, if we're going to be safeguarded from the destruction, the judgment that's coming upon the earth. It says, and then the woman fled to the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. See, they are, the, the devil and his angels are in the supernatural realm also. They're not in hell. So the dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. The whole world now. Not just those over there in uh, the Middle East or those over there in Asia. No, he deceives the whole world. He's deceiving America right now. Who deceives the whole world. He was cast to earth and his angels were cast out with them. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they, who's they? It's us. And they, the body of Christ, those who have been born again from above, the one for whom the Jerusalem above is our mother, they have overcame the devil by means of the blood of the Lamb, and the word of their testimony. For they did not love their lives to the death. Now, that's not talking about a suicide. That, that's not talking about um, self-hatred. That's, that's talking about recognizing when the world that we know has been corrupted. And when the world as it's presenting itself to us is an illusion. And that's recognizing that the, the way we're accustomed to functioning in this world is not just. And, and that God has got a different standard of justice. And that he wants to use us to display those three things. There. So Father, I thank you for instilling in us purity, sobriety, and justice. That we will understand justice as more than just settling the score or uh, back at you or, or retaliation, but that we will see your idea, your, your principle of what is just and what is right. And that because Jesus bore the judgment that was due to each one of us for our sins. We don't have to pay for our sins. Help us to recognize that others don't have to pay for their sins if they will believe. And so that, that we are tasked, just like Timothy's mother and his grandmother, to, to live by faith and, and to promote faith to all those who will listen to us. And Lord, it, it's all up to you to do that by your spirit. But we do commit ourselves to you for that task. And we know the hour is late, but we know that, that all things are possible with you, and it's never too late with you. 
And so I thank you, Father, for, for using us, for, for moving in the lives of those for whom we're interceding. And we give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.